Well, good afternoon. My name is Simon Bronnett. I'm the head and dean of Sydney Law School. And it's my privilege to welcome you to the Gadigal campus, uh, to the new law building um, for this very important event, um, uh, which is um, titled, The Modern Slavery Act Review, Can the Law Drive Meaningful Change? Uh, it's a very uh, pertinent question that you could apply to many things at this particular point in our history um, with the referendum um, this weekend. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, I would like to acknowledge country, and I do so uh, in the language of our indigenous people, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation. Yini Kalawagan Mari Bujuri Gadi Nurida. I was taught that by Professor Jackie Troy, who is the Director of Indigenous Research. She's a dear friend and um, played a very significant role uh, in ATSIC, in the Native Title Unit, but also um, in recording and preserving the language of the people of the Gadi. The Gadi are those amazing uh, Indigenous plants that are all around uh, this campus. Uh, it is a, a time now, of course, as we commit not only as a law school to the principles in the Uluru Statement, I should say almost two and a half, three years ago, the law school board uh, endorsed the Uluru Statement. Um, we were the first in this university, first component of this university to do that. And uh, I'm so, so proud that so many other parts of this university has taken that position. We don't know what the outcome is, but we will be there advancing the aspirations of that invitation from our First Nations people. So why is uh, Sydney University uh, hosting this event? Well, the university is committed to human rights. Uh, and I have to say, since joining the university in 2019, I have seen great strides in its efforts to take more seriously its obligation to address modern slavery. I mean, I see it as part of a, uh, a law school's mission uh, to obviously not only teach the law, but to promote um, and encourage debate about uh, social justice. Um, and in this respect, obviously, we're looking at uh, the social uh, responsibility of institutions, corporations, as well as governments. And there are a number of colleagues here who, including my, uh, the professor of uh, human rights, it's not a very, he's on sabbatical, David Kinley, Professor David Kinley, also a, another colleague and uh, collaborator, uh, has done a lot of work um, with Kim Sheehan on business and human rights. Um, I do think universities um, have a very important role to play in creating forums like this uh, to, to foster um, debate, open and informed debate on modern slavery. Uh, and it goes beyond the simple obligation that as a large entity, as an, employ as an employer, uh, as an educational institution uh, of just meeting our legal statutory requirements under legislation. Uh, as reporting ent entities, we have compliance obligations, clearly, but we are also thought leaders and we have uh, unique skill sets as academics uh, to engage in research and also to disseminate that research. So um, in terms of what we're going to do today, we're going to ha invite um, um, uh, our uh, opening remarks from the Australian Ambassador for counter, uh, Countering Modern Slavery, People Smuggling and Human Trafficking, uh, Ms. Lynn Bell, uh, followed by um, an, uh, an address, a keynote address from Professor John McMillan, AO, uh, who is obviously the author of the Modern Slavery Act Review. And um, I should say right at the outset, um, uh, in relation to all the um, participants, the speakers, as well as the panel members, uh, and I acknowledge here uh, Associate Professor Anna Boucher and Professor Jennifer Burns, that what we, uh, all of their bios are available um, on, in the handouts and on, on online. 
Um, so I'll, I'll be giving a, a truncated um, uh, presentation. I also, have, of course, have to acknowledge the amazing uh, work of our unit in the university that has done so much work in transforming our position from, I don't want to say being a laggard uh, in relation to these areas, but certainly putting us, I think, uh, much further at the head of the pack uh, in the universities in addressing these issues. Uh, and it is Esti Masu uh, who has done an amazing job, uh, including in creating, um, not only in coordinating academics, and coordinating academics, as you know, is like herding cats. Um, she does an amazing job in bringing together a whole range of people uh, that enabled us to have a, a submission uh, to uh, John in the review. So let me um, uh, uh, first give you a, a um, short biography of the ambassador. Uh, I don't know if you go by Her Excellency. I suppose some might in the diplomatic community, some might. Um, uh, Your Excellency um, uh, plays a key role in driving international cooperation on human trafficking, people smuggling and related transnational crimes. She works closely with partners on collaboration and policy development in the Asia Pacific region and beyond, uh, and comes to the role from previous appointments in DFAT, in crisis preparedness, and uh, the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, and in Papua New Guinea. So um, I would first um, like to invite um, <coughs> Lynn. Her Excellency Lynn Bell to the podium to make some opening remarks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Professor Bronnett, uh, for the very warm welcome and the opportunity to join everyone here today. I uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd really like to acknowledge uh, the academics, the scholars, and the significant experience here in the room today with us, uh, and all of your collective efforts uh, toward a more fair, just, and compassionate society. Uh, you've worked very hard over a number of years, uh, and I've watched your progress very closely. So we're here today to talk about Australia's Modern Slavery Act uh, and the context in which that legislation sits. The 2022 Global Estimates of Modern Slavery, produced by the International Labour Organisation, the International Office for Migration and Walk Free, found there were almost 50 million victims of modern slavery on any given day in 2021, including 27.6 million in forced labour. Recent reports by the UN Office on Drugs and Crime and the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights indicate that human trafficking is increasing, particularly uh, for forced criminality in online scam centres and profits for organised crime uh, in the billions of dollars. We also know that compounding crises, including natural disasters, armed conflict, climate change and the impact of COVID-19 pandemic together have heightened the risks of exploitation and all forms of modern slavery. So no country and no business is immune. To be successful in our efforts to combat modern slavery, um, we need strong national, regional and global efforts. And the Australian government is deeply committed to tackling modern slavery and to persisting even when meaningful change feels hard and uncertain. In Australia, we use the term modern slavery to refer to a range of serious exploitative practices, including human trafficking, forced labour, and the worst forms of child labour. In 2018, the Australian Government established the Modern Slavery Act to drive private sector action to combat modern slavery in supply chains by increasing transparency. Under the Act, large businesses and entities operating in Australia must report annually on their actions to address modern slavery risks in their operations and supply chains. The Australian Government's online register of modern slavery statements uh, makes this information publicly available and it's available at modernslaveryregister.gov.au. The register currently hosts more than 8,300 modern slavery statements, covering nearly 9,000 entities headquartered in 58 countries. By asking entities to annually develop publicly available reporting on their actions, 
The Act elevates the issue of modern slavery, including trafficking in forced labour, to the boardroom. And as a result, thousands of boards across Australia are now discussing these issues, increasing awareness of modern slavery risks in supply chains and operations. We also acknowledge that governments must set standards for accountability. In recognition of this, the Modern Slavery Act also requires the Australian Government to report, and the Australian Government has published three modern slavery statements since December 2020. The fourth Commonwealth Statement, covering the 22-23 financial year, will be published by the end of this year. In its statements, the Government takes a targeted and risk-based approach to assessing and addressing modern slavery risks in our supply chains and operations. The 21-22 statement focused on five high-risk areas, uh, investments, textile procurement, overseas construction, cleaning and ICT hardware. And the 2022-23 statement will build on this approach going deeper into supply chains to better understand the modern slavery risks across government portfolios. As a result of the Modern Slavery Act and increasing public scrutiny, there's also increasing awareness amongst consumers and investors of their power to drive change. The publicly available reports provide a window into global supply chains for Australian consumers and investors, and businesses that submit robust and comprehensive statements can demonstrate their leadership on modern slavery and show their own responsible business practices and their own action in line with integrity. This can help businesses to attract customers, access new business opportunities, provide a competitive advantage and build their own reputations. Equally, businesses that take a minimum compliance approach may find themselves um, exposed to a lack, of investor a lack of investor confidence and undermine their own ability to expand their business into the future. To ensure the Modern Slavery Act is, is fit for purpose, an independent review was undertaken by Professor John McMillan, AO, and we all look forward to hearing from you very shortly, John. The review report tabled earlier this year contains 30 recommendations, as we know, for strengthening the Act. The Government will respond to the review in 2024 after careful consideration of the recommendations. As you're aware, the Government has already announced its commitment to establish an anti-slavery commissioner. Once appointed, the Commissioner will play an important role in informing further steps in Australia's response to modern slavery. Recognising that no country can tackle these complex transnational crimes alone, Australia continues to build and strengthen legal and policy frameworks with partners in the region to counter trafficking and forced labour. The Foreign Ministers of Australia and Indonesia work closely together as co-chairs of the Bali process on people smuggling, trafficking in persons and related transnational crime. And that's a regional platform for policy dialogue, information sharing and practical cooperation on these issues. It includes 45 member governments comprising source, transit and destination countries for irregular migration, as well as four United Nations organisations. Uh, just this morning, I returned from Bangkok, where I attended the Bali Process Regional Support Office 2023 Constructive Dialogue, uh, which you'll be pleased to know lived up to its name and was an opportunity for some very detailed conversations uh, with member states about the importance of collaboration to crack down on trafficking for forced criminality, illicit financial flows, and the exploitation of women, men, and children. The Bali process also recognises the importance of cooperation with business. In 2017, Bali process ministers launched the Government and Business Forum, which brings together ministers and business leaders from Bali process countries to drive real practical initiatives. In 2018, Bali Process Ministers endorsed a set of recommendations developed by business built around three pillars, acknowledge, act and advance. The AAA recommendations provide a framework for business and government to collaborate on these issues by acknowledging the scale of human trafficking, taking action to address the problem and advancing the issues, recognising it often requires a long-term and active approach to create lasting change. The AAA recommendations include actions to promote greater supply chain transparency, ethical recruitment, protection for victims and survivors, and access to redress mechanisms. They also recognise the diversity within the countries and businesses of the forum, and therefore the importance of tailoring our responses to different contexts and capacities. Over the COVID period, when in-person meetings were very difficult and in fact not possible, 
the government and business forum moved to an online consultation and innovation mechanism. Uh, we held consultations at a sectoral level, taking a sectoral focus uh, and sharing experience and best practice. Uh, since October 2020, we've held five online sessions uh, focused on modern slavery risks in the finance, fishing, electronics, garments and shipping sectors. But we're also here today uh, to talk about the changing nature and emerging threats and the fundamental role research plays in understanding modern slavery, human trafficking and responding to these truly terrible crimes that impact so many <coughs> members of our community. I'd like to recognise civil society, the university sector and international organisations for the critical work that they do to gather data, conduct interviews, publish information and analysis, and to raise awareness of and to advocate for issues relating to modern slavery and human trafficking. Your expertise and research and very practical interventions and assistance for victim survivors are fundamental to combating modern slavery, both here in Australia and around the world, um, as is listening very carefully to the voices of victim survivors. I'd also like to recognise the Human Trafficking and Modern Slavery Research Network established by the Australian Institute of Criminology to promote and share research about human trafficking and modern slavery in Australia. Strengthening the evidence base to inform policy and program design is vital work that's recognised in Australia's national action plan to combat modern slavery. The network currently has 55 members from government, civil society, academia and business and aims to identify and promote research on these issues from across multiple sectors. So to conclude, governments have a pivotal role to play in developing and strengthening legal and policy frameworks, domestically, working with partners at home and abroad, and leading by example, but collaborative partnerships are always key to eliminating modern slavery from global supply chains. Success will require a response built together with survivors, business, civil society, academia, as well as with domestic, regional and international partners. What we do collectively matters and together we all have to walk the walk. Thank you. I'm so delighted that the uh, um, event has drawn such a large crowd. We now have to put more chairs out. So, uh, um, and I think that speaks to the, the issues that the ambassador, uh, Lynn, uh, has outlined um, and the growing interest in this whole area. Um, so turning uh, to um, the keynote, um, welcoming my former colleague, uh, like John, I spent 20 years uh, at ANU uh, as, a, as an academic. Um, we overlapped for a decade, uh, I think. Um, uh, and uh, I have to say, it's so lovely to see him here. And I'd just like to acknowledge also the incredible um, mentorship I received from amazing colleagues. I think it's only when you move on to other institutions, you really get a sense of persp perspective on how special uh, and important uh, some of my senior colleagues uh, were in shaping the kind of scholar uh, uh, that we have uh, produced at ANU. Uh, and um, I know I shouldn't be saying that as the Dean of Sydney Law School, but I also can see quite a few ANU law gra graduates here in the audience. Um, but look, um, it, it, I think uh, I'd just like to um, uh, give a, a short uh, rundown of John's um, uh, contribution here. As he would say, he, he, he wasn't an expert in modern slavery. Um, or the act until given the task of uh, uh, reviewing it. He is, of course, extremely well uh, qualified, not only because of his distinguished career in law and public service, uh, um, after his time as it would have been enough to have been a professor of public law, administrative law uh, at ANU, but uh, to then pursue an extraordinary career, um, as many of my colleagues uh, have done um, and I should acknowledge here the passing of Paul Finn, our dear colleague, who is an extraordinary, another example of an amazing scholar um, of uh, public law, of private law, and also a federal court judge uh, who passed away just recently. 
Um, so John obviously pursued a career of public service after uh, his time, 20 years at ANU. He was the ombudsman. He conducted many investigations, independent reviews uh, into corruption, healthcare, and public, man uh, public management. He remains, of course, emeritus professor at ANU, uh, where, of course, he shaped a whole generation of hashtag inspiring legal minds, uh, not at Sydney, but at ANU, um, for, for 20 years. So I'd like to invite uh, John uh, to um, uh, give the keynote address. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Simon, for those very kind words. As, um, as Simon has uh, rightfully uh, said, we often remember our colleagues much more fondly when we're away from the cut and thrust of a normal uh, academic debate, but uh, I have very fond memories of, uh, of uh, working with uh, Simon in a, a vibrant law faculty. Uh, let me say I'm delighted that uh, so many people have uh, come along today. It's always heartening that there are uh, many people uh, wanting to engage constructively in debate about how to uh, address the abhorrent uh, problem of modern slavery. Uh, as Lynn has outlined, the uh, accepted estimate at the moment is that um, there could be, as on any given day, there could be close to 50 million people uh, globally in situations of modern slavery, uh, the drivers of uh, modern slavery are, are numerous, uh, poverty, economic shocks, gender inequality, uh, exploitative business practices, and, uh, and weak government and regulatory inadequacy. So um, addressing the problem of modern slavery, as Lynn said, is a, a complex and um, transnational uh, challenge. Uh, Australia has a large number of uh, programs in place at both the uh, Commonwealth, uh, state and territory level um, to address modern slavery. There's a, a particular focus on um, the risks in procurement. Um, universities uh, play a very active role in this area, um, both uh, through their research, um, but also at administrative level. Uh, universities are well aware that in procuring um, uh, goods and services uh, domestically and internationally, that there could be modern slavery practices uh, um, uh, occurring or hidden at some stage in the supply network. Um, universities uh, acquire local services, uh, uh, cleaning, computing, where uh, modern slavery practices may be present. Uh, uh, there's always uh, a possibility of uh, of modern slavery uh, risks in student welfare and in participating in research projects uh, locally and internationally. So universities have taken this uh, topic very seriously uh, and so it, it is, as I say, heartening to see uh, so many joining in the forum today. Now, one of the mechanisms that Australia adopted uh, about five years ago to address the challenge of modern slavery was to enact the Modern Slavery Act. Um, it's an act that requires large businesses and, uh, and government entities and charities and the like um, to submit an annual statement to the Australian government on the steps that have been taken uh, by the business in the previous year to address modern slavery risks in their domestic and uh, global uh, operations and supply chains. Uh, and these statements are placed on an online register, the Modern Slavery Statement Register. There are, as Lynn said, um, over 8,000 statements published on the register. Uh, the number of searches on the register, um, probably around about 2.5 million, many of them um, by researchers, but also by uh, companies uh, checking each other and to some extent um, by uh, consumers and others. Now, this act required that a review be conducted after three years into the operation of the Modern Slavery Act and to make um, proposals if necessary for reform. And, and I was privileged to 
conduct that review over the last two years and the report was published um, earlier this year and there will in time be a government response. So what I will do in the remainder of my talk is, is talk about the, um, the review and, uh, and the reflections that it make uh, on the, made on the capacity and opportunity of this modern slavery reporting uh, mechanism to have an impact on the, um, uh, the global problem. Now, let me just, yep, there we go. I'll firstly say um, um, just a, a little bit about the key features of the review that I undertook because there was, it really was an engaging uh, process uh, in which there was a, a really high number of very constructive uh, ideas coming forward. But, uh, where am I, am I not, ah, there we go, I'm pointing the right direction. Um, the review was held over the course of a year and uh, there was a large number of 38 sessions and uh, 65 uh, meetings, 285 organisations uh, participated. Um, a large number made very constructive um, submissions. I must say, but having conducted a number of reviews, uh, I was struck by uh, just the high quality of the submissions to this review, far higher than I've ordinarily seen in other reviews. And indeed, one of the best submissions that I uh, received was from the University of Sydney. Um, it had a very constructive presentation in which it uh, drew both on its operational experience and its research experience. And so on all of the consultation questions that I had posed, um, it, uh, the university responded on what it saw as a reporting entity under the Modern Slavery Act and what the research conducted by its own uh, academic members had shown. So um, examples of that show the, uh, the, the deep commitment that uh, um, exists in, uh, uh, in many areas to addressing modern slavery risks. Uh, we also, under, as part of this, undertook a survey of reporting entities and close to 500 uh, reported. Um, overall, it was very diverse participation in the review from government, business, uh, investors, uh, civil society, unions, researchers, charities, and also victim survivors. And, and what was striking was that when the debate had started about five years earlier, um, the, the views tended to line up in terms of what business thought and what civil society uh, thought. But that had changed over the course of... Uh, three years and so there was a much more dispersed and constructive view, for example, on one of the issues that I'll come to in a little while about which entities should be um, required to report. Um, many business submissions were much more uh, uh, attuned to the idea of broadening the reporting base where as many civil society organisations wanted to keep it somewhat narrower so that they could focus on where they thought the real problem areas lay. But it was um, just a, an example of how the sophistication in, the, in appreciation of the issue had grown over many years. And, and then the report made um, 30 recommendations for legislative and uh, administrative reform. And, and before I go through those, I'll just mention what I thought were the sort of the four headline or takeaway messages from this um, review exercise. Um, the first is that the Modern Slavery Act um, uh, has drawn attention in a significant way to the problem of modern slavery um, in Australia. There's widespread recognition now um, of the term uh, modern slavery. Uh, um, many people have heard of the Act and, as I've indicated, participation in this review was uh, very high and of uh, uh, a standout um, quality. So while the Act is only one of many strategies or many mechanisms uh, required to address modern slavery, it's, uh, it's certainly um, um, drawn attention to the problem significantly. Um, secondly, um, uh, my sense was that the Act is being taken seriously um, across many sectors. Though there are a number of independent studies, um, uh, including from universities, which said that the reporting under the Act was not at the high standard it should be, 
and uh, some of it was described as a kind of a, you know, a tick and flick um, reporting exercise or sort of minimalist regulatory compliance. Um, uh, it seemed to me you know, that the act is being taken seriously uh, across mass uh, sectors. Um, there can be deeper explanations to, as to why the reporting is not of the standard that it should be. Um, but what is particularly noticeable is that modern slavery uh, is now addressed directly in business planning and governance arrangements in, uh, in all large corporations. There are separate sections uh, devoted full time to reviewing the modern slavery strategy and advising the executive board, the, uh, uh, the senior, the, the board of directors and the general manager of corporations have to sign off on their modern slavery statement. And uh, the impression is by and large, they take that seriously. There's also quite um, uh, a, um, a noticeable um, cross-sector conversation now between business, civil society groups, universities, um, um, researchers uh, and government. So that's been a step forward. The third point though is that reporting cannot be an end in itself. There are uh, a large number, among the 8,000 reports, there are a large number of, um, of very high quality presentation glossy reports. But that alone uh, cannot be the measure of whether the Act is achieving its purpose. Um, the underlying purpose is to make a difference, to stop modern slavery, to assist victims, uh, to impl implement protections for people who are vulnerable. Um, and a common and undisputed view in the inquiry I undertook is that there is yet no hard evidence, um, no confirmed storyline that the Act is having a difference on the ground. However, just take the fourth takeaway message um, on the big question, can a reporting mechanism of this kind make a difference? Um, opinions uh, differ and uh, some people say, you know, abandon the exercise, uh, direct the attention elsewhere or look instead at other options that I'll uh, mention in a moment. Um, while there is a spectrum of opinions, there was a, a very strong view put to me uh, um, coming from all sectors um, that, um, uh, that the Act can make a difference if it's made to work better. Uh, there's a recognition that we're at the beginning of a long and uh, difficult challenge. Overtaking the drivers of modern slavery will be hard. But the first step in addressing modern slavery is to get uh, big business and government um, to reflect on the fact that slavery practices may um, be part of their operations and supply chains in ways that they were previously unaware. So that's the essential purpose of a, um, a reporting uh, mechanism. One, to raise awareness of the problem, and two, to get large entities to think seriously about whether, uh, whether slavery is built into their uh, commercial operations in a way that they're um, sustaining, encouraging, or supporting us. So that takes us to the, um, the, the recommendations from uh, uh, my uh, report, and I'll just deal with these in, um, in three stages. Um, one, I made two recommendations that, in a sense, just reinforce um, assumptions that are already in uh, the Act, but I've no doubt that um, if these recommendations are accepted by government, um, they'll have quite an impact on the ground. Um, one is that entities be required to, um, to put in place a, um, a due diligence um, uh, system, uh, sorry, I'll just turn it, a due diligence system for combating and reporting on modern slavery risks. Now, the concept of due diligence has really become the global norm in terms of human rights uh, reporting, environmental reporting, social governance uh, reporting. Uh, the idea of the concept of due diligence is meant to capture the idea that you've got 
to take active steps um, to review <laughs> your own business practices to see um, whether um, the, 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 the ill, the harm that is being addressed um, is being tackled properly. Uh, the Modern Slavery Act and all the guideline material on modern slavery um, rests on the assumption that entities will be taking this due diligence activity. But there's a large debate as to whether they are. And so my recommendation was that this be spelt out more directly um, in the Act uh, and that reinforced by a penalty so that uh, uh, the annual modern slavery statement from uh, uh, a large corporation, charity, government would have to explain the, the due diligence system it had in place and uh, how it was being used and monitored to address modern slavery risks. Um, uh, the second assumption that uh, when it's spelled out explicitly um, is, is to apply a penalty to a failure to report. Uh, at the moment, there's an obligation on entities to report, um, but it's a sense, it's, and it's assumed they will do so and do so honestly, but there is no enforcement mechanism applying to it. So, you know, in, in a formal legal sense, it's a, um, it's a voluntary compliance uh, exercise. Naming and shaming is the... Uh, uh, is the main uh, enforcement mechanism. So I recommended that penalties be uh, applied to a failure to report, false reporting, or a failure to put a, a due diligence system in place. Now, it's not expected that um, you know, penalties would be routinely applied or that there'd be a higher level of prosecution activity. It is it's simply a formal way of saying, when this Act says you've got to do a report and you've got to do it, uh, Honestly and uh, genuinely, the Act means what it says. And if you, uh, you don't, then you'll at least face the, th the threat of uh, enforcement action. So that would send uh, a strong message. Uh, then there were uh, a couple of recommendations to uh, extend the, uh, the scheme of the Act. Uh, at the moment, the Act applies to entities that have... Uh, uh, an annual uh, revenue turnover of fifty million dollars or more, and also to uh, to large uh, to, to government agencies, and I recommended that um, that threshold be lowered to uh, fifty million, uh, and that would double the number, at least uh, double the number of entities that um, that will be required to uh, report, and there was. It was a fairly evenly divided issue about whether it's better to keep the reporting obligation focused on the larger corporations that really do have the resources and the capacity and the uh, the commitment to addressing modern slavery or whether to um, uh, extend the obligation more generally to send a message to all business, uh, whatever size, um, that addressing modern slavery is a corporate uh, um, or institutional responsibility, and, and I opted to uh, to recommend that it be lowered. Um, it would uh, uh, Australia uh, was at the forefront in enacting a modern slavery act, um, and, and internationally, um, the reporting standard is probably closer to a sort of a fifty million dollar than a uh, hundred million dollar annual turnover level. So, proposal is that if Australia wants to remain a, a leader the forefront in this field, then it should, um, in a sense, follow uh, uh, that uh, trend elsewhere. Uh, and the other, the government has already announced that it's going to establish an anti-slavery commissioner. Uh, there currently is an anti-slavery commissioner in New South Wales. Um, there is no similar uh, ent uh, commissioner or entity at the national level. Uh, and the uh, report, uh, so there, there is a government commitment um, uh, there and the report uh, makes recommendations for what the, the anti-slavery commissioner would do in this field. It's expected the anti-slavery commissioner would have a whole range of responsibilities, um, uh, particularly responsibilities in uh, encouraging coordination and liaison between uh, um, business, non-government groups, research and civil society. Um, but the commissioner can also play uh, an active role in this area of improving reporting, um, 
uh, drawing attention to uh, international standards and how Australia can, um, can, can either meet them or is slipping behind, and perhaps assist reporting by, for example, uh, making uh, occasional declarations on what are the high-risk areas or challenges that should be explicitly addressed in, um, uh, in uh, annual reporting. Otherwise, though, I recommended that the, you know, the administrative responsibilities in this area remain as they presently are with the Attorney General's Department and the Department of Foreign Affairs, and that the, you know, the main challenge of the Anti-Slavery Commissioner is to work out how they can make a difference by adding a, a level of, uh, of value um, to current efforts that is probably lacking. And then very briefly, um, there are a number of recommendations to clarify or strengthen uh, current reporting obligations. Um, that uh, at the moment the Act lists seven criteria against which agencies must report and their operations, their due diligence act, a activity, um, the reasonable steps they're taking to address risks. And I recommended that um, uh, there be additional um, uh, criteria, uh, for example, the number of incidents that have been <coughs> Uh, modern slavery incidents identified by a company during a, a year, um, the grievance complaint and consultation mechanisms that it's formally established um, to enable um, uh, workers or contractors to report modern slavery incidents or consultation with workers on challenges or issues they're facing. Um, recommended at, at the moment uh, there are over 8,000 reports. So, the problem quickly becomes one of overload. You know, how do people realistically penetrate 8,000 reports? If one of the assumptions is that um, the annual reporting makes consumers more aware of which products and so on to buy, uh, how realistic is that assumption? Uh, and so I uh, made a number of recommendations for kind of streamlining the, um, um, the reporting um, so that it's a lot easier to compare and to analyse statements, um, reporting templates, cover sheets, uh, requiring sort of three-year reporting with updating in the interim. Um, then, as I've mentioned already, um, there should be a mechanism for actually identifying the high-risk areas for, so, so, so that uh, uh, reporting entities explicitly have to address that, uh, re re revise the government guidance material, uh, at the moment, there is no annual list of companies that report. It's very hard to work out whether a company that should be reporting is not because uh, uh, other than by doing a search through this online register, you will uh, find it uh, very difficult. And if you just put in the name of a company at the moment, it will bring up the name of that company in every modern slavery statement. So there are some simple administrative steps that can be taken um, to make it... Uh, uh, reporting easier to analyse but also make it easier for the very active um, civil society uh, uh, groups in this area um, to, to review whether companies are reporting as they should be and taking it seriously. Um, and then, as I've got there, um, review the... Uh, uh, should be... You know, the Commonwealth Modern Slavery Statement is supposed to set the high standard... Uh, but there's no external mechanism in place um, to ensure that that happens. And again, to perhaps a complaint procedure um, so that uh, people can register their concerns about inadequate reporting and have a separate mechanism for addressing that. And finally, I just mentioned three very important matters that I didn't address and the reason is that they were beyond the terms of reference. Um, uh, but these are... Uh, these were mentioned in a large number of submissions I receive as matters that have to be addressed, um, at least by some other review process. And as you'll see, um, uh, one is import bans on goods made with uh, forced or child labour. Um, America, that's the main strategy, for example, used at the national level in, in America to have import bans on goods from the um, Xinjiang region, uh, or well, there's a there's a uh, uh, there's a mechanism for creating a presumption that goods are, are produced with a modern slavery element, and the importer then uh, the goods are stopped at the border, and the importer has a has a, um, a, a an obligation to rebut that presumption if it wants to bring the goods in. 
uh, victim compensation and um, support. There are a number of, uh, of mechanisms out there providing support to, for victims, but there are a lot of recommendations as to how they, uh, those mechanisms should be improved and providing compensation perhaps through uh, an actionable, uh, uh, actionable procedures would again be a way of, uh, of ensuring that uh, modern slavery obligations are taken seriously. And then finally, um, uh, government, governments are the largest procurers in Australia. So if we want to address uh, modern slavery, the good place is to start with, uh, with governments. And Department of Defence is a good example, uh, uh, probably the single largest procurer in Australia. So again, government um, can set the standard um, if there, there... There is a lot of work done in this area and there are um, a, a, a principles... Uh, um, that, uh, that that operate, but the view is that look, there needs to be a more coherent, comprehensive framework in which this is all brought together, and an anti-slavery commissioner can play a key role in ensuring that there's uh, oversight and coordination of the different measures. So, thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Um, that outline of my uh, review, and I look forward to the following discussion in which some elements of that may be raised, but equally some of the other strategies for um, addressing modern slavery can, uh, can be addressed. Oh, well, I'll stay here. So we'll move into a, a panel discussion now, um, and I'll do my best to channel Q and A. No, I'm definitely not Stan Grant. Um, so, if adopted by the government, John, one of the most significant outcomes, obviously, of the review is the recommendation, recommendation to introduce a due diligence obligation. Uh, this obligation would position Australia as a leader in modern slavery legislation and reflect a growing international conviction that due diligence should be the core strategy in addressing human rights abuses. So this is the question. Um, a widespread finding from the consultation was there was no hard evidence that the Act had caused meaningful change for people living in conditions of modern slavery. How do you think due diligence uh, would, would address that concern? I, I, thanks, Alex. It's, it's a it, it, there is already sort of indicated an assumption there that, uh, that entities are undertaking uh, uh, due diligence uh, analysis and have systems in place, but there is no way, no effective way of uh, examining or monitoring um, whether that is occurring at the moment other than through occasional research projects. So, um, the, um, so the, you know, an actionable legal obligation to implement uh, a due diligence system will make it easier overall to send that message to government and, and big business that they've, they've got to ask themselves, well, what is a due diligence system? You know, uh, uh, we, we've got... You know, they have a framework, a plan for you know, what are all the risks, uh, what are the strategies, uh, how are we measuring success against that uh, on a recurring basis, uh, what procedures do we have for enabling you know, workers, contractors, uh, the community generally to tell us about uh, uh, failings or, or gaps in, in the system. I, it's... Uh, you know, a, a system by itself doesn't produce the result, but I think the, uh, it, this is the necessary um, step that, uh, that has to be taken, both under this Act, but also generally in terms of, uh, of having business address it. As I say. And it's a familiar concept now. It's the global norm that's used in a whole lot of laws about um, workplace practices, about... Uh, illegal logging uh, and about and, and environmental risks. So it will, it will tap into a, a kind of a 
you know, a, a vibrant gap stuff that's already out there. Thanks, John. Uh, Professor Jennifer Byrne, welcome. Uh, welcome from UTS, not too far to come. Um, you've been supporting survivors of trafficking and uh, slavery in Australia for over two decades. And you're a key advocate in survivor-informed responses to modern slavery. And you founded um, Anti-Slavery Australia, the only specialist centre providing free legal representation to people experiencing modern slavery. And I should say and acknowledge the fact that for your efforts in this very important area, you were this year um, awarded the Order of Australia. Congratulations. Look, my question is, um, would a stronger modern slavery act create meaningful change for people with lived experience? Does it go far enough? And I'll invite you to the podium. Um, hello, everyone. It's really wonderful to be here with you all. These kind of events are so important um, because we get an opportunity to consult with each other and to learn from each other. I'd like to acknowledge country, pay my respects to the traditional owners and to elders past, present and emerging. It was great to hear from the ambassador at the beginning, thank you, and from Professor McMillan, and I'm delighted to be here um, with Anna and SD2. So the question was um, really, can law, can law drive meaningful change and does the act go far enough? Well, I'd like to address the law question first. So law can drive change and indeed we've seen that it has through the Modern Slavery Act. And Professor McMillan has reflected on the act and described the review process. The legislation can create meaningful change if the legislation is drafted in consultation with stakeholders, if there are mechanisms in place to implement the law, policies, monitoring and review of the law. Now, thinking about the Modern Slavery Act, in preparation today, I did go back and read again the second reading speech. And it's absolutely clear, you know, and John has explained that the Modern Slavery Act is limited to a transparency in supply chain framework. And John, I should call you Professor McMillan. <laughs> it's too late now. <laughs> um, has made 30 recommendations about what he's called the reform process. The Modern Slavery Act was not intended to address the broader needs of people with lived experience. And I did make a very brief submission and I, I was one of the people who raised matters beyond the terms of reference and um, I'm going to discuss some of those with you here today. So I recommend broadening the objects and the scope of the Modern Slavery Act to prioritise human rights of victim survivors. This year is the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 4, no one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Article 8, everyone has the right to an effective remedy. The UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Slavery says that harnessing the lived experience of victims and survivors has the potential to strengthen government legislative and policy initiatives and it will benefit survivors. In this way, anti-slavery efforts should be survivor-informed and victim-centred by incorporating victim-survivor identification, protection and support provisions into the legislation, into the Modern Slavery Act. A survivor-centred response to modern slavery conceptualises survivors as rights holders who are entitled to opportunities to meaningfully participate in decisions that affect them. Too often, survivor engagement is limited to the telling of a story. But survivors' knowledge and experience can shape policy in a much broader way. And this is why my colleague Frances Simmons and I um, wrote a report called Beyond Storytelling Towards Survivor-Informed Responses to Modern Slavery. 
It is essential that the victim survivor is placed at the centre of any action to address modern slavery. And we recommended that one way of doing that is to establish a mechanism, a legislative mechanism for the survivor voice. Engagement, of course, should be meaningful. It should not be tokenistic. It should be remunerated, valued and supported. So we have, we've recommended the establishment of a survivor advisory council that could be one of the reform issues um, in the new version of the Modern Slavery Act. Um, if, if included in the Act, um, the Act would be strengthened and people with lived experience would have the mechanism to meaningfully contribute to the development of law and policy. The Survivor Advisory Council could have broad functions to provide advice and guidance to government on a range of initiatives, including the development and implementation of the next National Action Plan to combat modern slavery. The next issue that I'd like to speak to you about is Article 8 of the Declaration of Human Rights. There should be an effective remedy. Survivors have right, the right to access justice and to an effective remedy. It is very sad that Australia does not have a national compensation scheme for survivors of modern slavery. The crimes of modern slavery are federal offences and there is still no nationally consistent victims of crime compensation scheme for survivors of modern slavery. Rather, survivors may be eligible to access any of the eight different schemes that exist in each of the states and territories around Australia. And I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that each of those schemes are different, completely different. It just doesn't make sense. They're not designed to cover the full breadth of the Commonwealth crimes of modern slavery. And this is a failure. The lack of a coordinated approach to compensation has been a major impediment to victims of modern slavery obtaining fair, effective and timely access to justice and this departs from international best practice. A national compensation scheme is necessary to ensure that Australia meets its international commitments and it is consistent with the National Action Plan to combat modern slavery. So, to answer the question, <laughs> the Modern Slavery Act could be strengthened by the inclusion of a Survivor Advisory Council and the long overdue National Compensation Scheme for survivors of modern slavery. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'd like to turn now to Professor um, Anna Boucher. Um, Anna is a, uh, a graduate of this law school. Uh, she is a uh, global migration expert, advisor to government and international agencies, including the UN's ILO, International Labour Organization, and the OECD, on immigration policy and migrant worker discrimination and labour exploitation. She is also um, professor, associate professor in political science. Um, she doesn't work in this law school. Um, I wish she did. <laughs> and she's the chair of discipline of government and international relations. So Anna, uh, this is the question. It's well recognized that migrant workers are disproportionately impacted by modern slavery in Australia and elsewhere. Your work has included research and policy advice to the Australian government to strengthen legal protections of temporary migrant workers. What do you see as the impact of a stronger modern slavery act for migrant workers? Um, so firstly, I would define a migrant worker as someone who has been in Australia for less than 10 years and is on a visa. So it can also include permanent residents. Um, obviously, slavery involves aspects that implicate migration, cross borders, movement, uh, transportation, trafficking, debt bondage with visa holders through um, sometimes debts owed for visa charges. 
So migration and modern slavery are intrinsically related. In my book, Patterns of Exploitation, some of the cases that are akin to modern slavery were litigated under the criminal code as modern slavery cases, and some are litigated under the Fair Work Act as egregious forms of underpayment. So um, my view is that this review, and I've read the full document, will strengthen protections for migrant workers, even though migration is not really a core theme in the written report, but it was in submissions, including the one we um, did at the University of Sydney. But that sits alongside other current federal government reforms, um, such as ones currently being uh, proposed in Parliament to the Fair Work Act with the gig economy, uh, the Parkinson Review and the Nixon Review, um, which was formally announced rather than leaked uh, last week, um, has a lot about modern slavery, particularly in the sex industry sector, but also in other sectors. So the way the government responds to the rapid uh, and implements policy around the rapid response will be important. I think the, the idea to appoint a modern, um, an anti-slavery commissioner at the federal level, recommendation 27, um, with the capacity to initiate reviews under notifiable instruments into key sectors will be a net improvement for migrant workers. The Fair Work Ombudsman already has the power, the investigative power, and um, he or she often does use that power to investigate sectors involving migrant workers, but arguably they could work together to look at sectors where modern slavery is uh, more than simply non-payment. There can be other dimensions as well. So I think that's a positive recommendation. Um, also, this will target behaviour beyond proactive reporting. <laughs> I was shocked to read that only 297 people in Australia had reported to the Australian Federal Police um, for modern slavery offences, so that's clearly just the tip of the iceberg. So a proactive um, power to the Commissioner would be beneficial. Um, closer examination, as is recommended in the review between the Fair Work Ombudsman and the Modern, uh, modern Fair Work Ombudsman, the Fair Work Act, and the Modern Slavery Act will be important. The review makes the point that this is not fair work reform, unlike New Zealand, where a lot of these reforms are in the employment law space. Um, so the Act is not proposing um, an expansion to all the sort of the ambit of labour law reform or in the United States where there's similar reforms to the garment sector. But still there was a proposal for more engagement with labour law. Uh, for instance, in these um, compliance reports, uh, employers having to say how they also abide by national employment standards. So I thought that was a good idea whilst keeping the two areas, the two statutes separate. Um, there is, a, as John mentioned, um, more companies with smaller profits um, or revenue, which might bring us into medium-sized entities, will be have this um, reporting requirement. And I think that's a good thing because we know, I definitely is demonstrated in my book, that migrant workers are more likely to work in smaller companies. It won't capture the very small companies, and that may be where some of the more egregious offences are occurring, but it will at least capture some of them. And then finally, I think throughout the review document is a focus on data harmonisation and improvement of data collection, and certainly that's something that I've been advocating for and I'm currently working with um, other departments federally to look at better data collection in this area, which could in turn inform the way that an anti-slavery commissioner or the Fair Work Ombudsman decide which sectors to investigate. Oh, and finally, one maybe criticism or um, something which I think is a recommendation which is good, but where I see challenges is the idea that within organisations, grievance and compliance mechanisms be established. I think it's hard for any modern slave to come forward with a complaint but even more so people with vulnerable visa status. Mm -hmm. So that's obviously something that will need to be unpacked a bit more, how to implement such a recommendation um, if there is a potential deportation risk um, in coming out and blowing the whistle about modern slavery mm -hmm. within your workplace. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, turning to Esty. Um, Esty is the director of the University Modern Slavery Unit, where she heads our strategic approach to addressing modern slavery risks across our research and education activities, supply chain and investments. Uh, I have to say I've been delighted since this unit was created that Esty has been incredibly with a team, proactive in reaching out to the academics, uh, not only here in the law school, but in other parts of the 
of the university to, to build strong partnerships and uh, develop some applied research and also create amazing work integrated learning opportunities for our amazing <laughs> students in the university to address human rights challenges. So SD, many of the recommendations of the review from designating certain products as high risk to sector specific guidance call for a stronger evidence base on modern slavery. Here there is an important role for the higher education sector. Other than providing much needed research, do universities have an active role to play in tackling modern slavery through their own due diligence provisions? Thanks so much, Simon. Um, and hello, everyone. It's so energizing to see so many of you in person on a Friday. So I just wanted to say a personal thank you for turning out today. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm so privileged to be in this position, because I get energized by how committed everyone is, not just at the University of Sydney, but in Australia, to address this issue. Um, it's a really good question. And the short answer is yes. But to understand why, I think we need to challenge the perhaps misconception that modern slavery is something that happens in large corporations with very large and complex global supply chains. Um, so, and I appreciated Ambassador Lin's opening remarks um, about the entity being immune to modern slavery risks and also Professor John McMillan um, highlighting some of the unique risks within the university sector. Um, but I wanted to just provide a bit of colour to that and to talk about what that active role should be and why it's so critical. So if you think of um, universities not too dissimilar to large corporations, um, universities have reporting obligations under the Modern Slavery Act. I think that's been well established. Um, but not dissimilar to large corporations, uh, universities have immense and diverse global supply chains. And I know I've got our colleagues here, we've got our CPO here and our procurement colleagues here who have heard me say this um, for many, many years. But um, to put that in a bit of context, um, if the University of Sydney was a listed company on the Australian Stock Exchange, um, our professor of Guy Ford, the director of the MBA program, recently reminded me that Sydney as a listed company would be listed in the top 50 companies on the AXX. So just think about the power, the purchasing power and leverage. Now, if you then combined the supply chain uh, purchasing power of Australia's top universities, just say the group of eight, um, that would equate to tens of billions of dollars in purchasing power and market leverage. So just considering it from that perspective, universities not just have an active role, but an incredible amount of power to really influ influence market standards as it comes to um, modern slavery due diligence. The other really um, interesting issue here, and um, I do want to spend a couple, just two minutes on this. Um, unlike corporations, though, large businesses, uh, the types of risks that universities grapple with are far more complex and they sit outside of supply chains. And this is why I'm, I'm very encouraged that the university executive have taken a value chain approach. And I know we've got our general counsel here, Olivia Perks, who's been talking about value chain for as long as I know, I've known her. And that for, the reason for that is because um, modern slavery risks within a university sector do actually materialize outside of supply chain. So international students um, often engaging in um, as migrant workers in the economy, we know uh, have been well documented to be exploited um, severely, to be experiencing debt bondage, forced marriage. Um, and what surprised me actually most in my role is how much our anti-slavery awareness campaign that we developed in collaboration with the amazing Professor Jennifer Byrne um, has resonated with students. Um, so putting a bit of colour to that, 9,000 University of Sydney students have proactively, voluntarily spent 20 to 25 minutes completing an online module on anti-slavery. And over 8,000 of them have left individual comments at the end. So that's just, you know, that just shows you how um, important this issue is to our student community. Um, so supporting our students, I mean, the universities need to have an active role. And picking up on the definition that Professor John touched on around what is due diligence actually mean? The premise of it is uh, a principle of being proactive, taking proactive steps to prevent harm. And I think if we look at the question as, do universities have an active role? Absolutely, they have an important proactive 
role that they need to play to support <coughs> students. But if we just look beyond that and looking at core functions of universities, and I think this is where there's been a little bit of um, mind-bending conceptual thinking needed, um, universities' core business is really research and education. So if you think of modern slavery as a supply chain issue, you're really going to miss that. Um, but when you look at value chains and you understand modern slavery um, as a value chain issue and you look at research and education activities at universities, you soon become rather alarmed at not only the risk of being linked to modern slavery but um, the risk of contributing to uh, human rights violations um, such as modern slavery in, in, the, in the form of forced labour, uh, child trafficking. Um, some of you may remember the ABC Four Corners report on this a couple of years ago where a number of universities in Australia were linked to human rights violations, including forced labour in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in China. Um, there's also been growing recognition of these types of risks and the role of universities in developing research in collaboration with partners um, that has been used to commit human rights violations and has enabled uh, trafficking of children online, um, forced labour in various countries. And um, certainly in the US, uh, a number of universities, Yale, MIT, Stanford, are now actively reviewing their business relationships for research and education placement purposes. Um, so that all sounds pretty grim, but um, so it's hard not to get a little bit discouraged <laughs> when you think of that. But in saying all of that, I think um, universities are also very uniquely placed to address these risks because, um, A, you know, we're one of the few sectors where its clients um, have real lived experience of um, modern slavery and picking up on Professor Burns' comments around engaging with survivor voice, we have an opportunity to do that and to, for that to really inform our own due diligence practice and for us to share that with government through submissions, through representations to um, various government departments or applied research work like Professor um, <laughs> Bausch is doing. So th the flip side to that is not only do we have an active role um, that we should be playing as due diligence practitioners, we can do that with the best evidence-based research data that's available within the university sector. And by applying it ourselves, I think that in itself becomes useful to government policy reform, to um, business performance, um, to establishing standards, to identifying data gaps. So, you know, I do think um, this is really more, and I, I've said this for a long time, I think this is quite a unique opportunity for the sector to make a meaningful impact on something that many other sectors feel quite baffled about and don't feel like they have the solutions, whereas I think we are well placed um, to provide some of those solutions. And I want to leave you on a positive note, so I do want to pick out some very exciting things that are happening in Sydney, and I know we've got the amazing Dr Jo Murray with us today. I, you know, one of the amazing things we're doing is working with astrophysicists um, in our School of Physics to map global supply chains and identify modern slavery hotspots within that. I mean, how cool is that? Um, I know we've got Professor Mary Crocky, and I want to acknowledge her amazing work in this space around immigration law and refugee law and quietly, tirelessly working away on this. We've got academics in the School of Business working on identifying products with high risk of modern slavery in their supply chain. So there's amazing work that's been done and I think that work along with strong due diligence practice. So as, as Ambassador Lynn said, being able to walk the talk as practitioners, um, I think says it all. So I'll leave it there because I'm curious to hear the questions from the audience. Well, look, thank you, uh, uh, SD. Uh, look, can you join with me in thanking the panellists at this point? <laughs> Just uh, reflecting on that uh, last point, um, you know, the, the role of the university in, um, I suppose, not only fostering amazing research, um, which... Uh, I think there's sometimes a tendency in universities, particularly in the senior leadership, when you have a problem, and particularly when it's framed in a compliance way, is to reach for the external consultant. <laughs> and dare I say at this moment in time, I'm quite glad that external consultants are struggling a bit with their uh, reputation in, in the wider society in Australia and globally, uh, because what, what we have in the university are amazingly expert um, researchers. The challenge always is to take research and make it 
um, um, useful and um, think about how it can be implemented uh, in ways that can uh, improve outcomes. Um, but we, we should be able to, as a group of educators and, um, and scholars um, and lifelong learners, and I'm describing here the academics, we're um, always learning new things, we should be able to then experiment and we should be open to thinking about doing things differently. Certainly I'm always <laughs> posing questions and I think that duty I see is not placed on me and I'm a criminal lawyer because I'm fearful of going to jail um, because I might breach uh, a provision uh, of any act because I believe uh, in the importance of prevention of these um, uh, human rights abuses. Uh, and we should be assured we can't be willfully blind. I think sometimes approaches to compliance be, well, if I don't know, I don't, I won't, I, it'll be better for me if I just close my mind to that risk. And I think that's a culpable state of mind. And I think new, new ideas like due diligence, putting that duty to prevent more, more um, uh, firmly will hopefully shift, shift that culture.